the design matters um, sort of idea that what we do matters. Um, it matters because people matter. And that's kind of the whole, the whole focus of where those core values sort of draw out of. Business of Architecture, episode 272. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and I am your host on this journey to discover the tips, strategies, and secrets of running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Now, one of the biggest challenges faced by architecture firm owners who want to grow a successful practice is that we do everything so well that we have a hard time delegating these things to other people because they won't be able to do it as well as we can, or at least that's what we think. Now, this is fine if you're a sole practitioner and you want to focus on small projects. However, as your firm grows, this becomes problematic. We hamstring ourselves by trying to do too much ourselves and not letting others share in the responsibility. And yet, relinquishing control can be hard. It's as much about our mindset, beliefs, and psychology as it is about knowing how to delegate. So let me ask you a question. Wouldn't it be nice if you could literally clone yourself so you could get twice as much three times as much, even 100 times as much done in one day. Of course, this is possible through what one of my mentors calls succeeding through others. The key to moving from being the architect who does everything yourself to being someone who has others do things for you is to attract, coach, and retain talented people to join your team. Well, today you're going to hear an interview with a firm leader who is doing this exceptionally well. Stacy Cox is the president of Studio 4 Design based in Knoxville, Tennessee. In this interview, Stacy drops some powerful knowledge about how to build a team that can achieve incredible things. And over the about 16 years that they've been in business, they haven't had anyone leave the firm because they were unhappy working there or moving to another firm in the same location, which is pretty remarkable not to have that kind of turnover. So before we hop into today's episode, I, I want to thank user M. Rainville, who left an awesome podcast review on iTunes. M. Rainville said, this podcast helps me gather my mind and prepare for the inevitable transition to starting my own firm. I'd love to hear more about how sole practitioners are making use of visual programming and database design, as this is my passion and hope. Well, that's a great question, M. Rainville. I suggest you go over, join the Business of Architecture Facebook group if you haven't already, because that's where these kind of conversations are happening. Now, if you haven't left a review yet on iTunes, it would be awesome if you did. And I will give you a shout out here on the show. And now on with today's show. So Stacy, welcome to the business of architecture. Thank you. Glad to be with you. So tell me the quick history of the firm so we can orient our listeners so they kind of know what kind of firm you have and how you got involved in the firm. Okay, great. Well, uh, Studio 4 Design was founded in 2002, so we're just over 16 and a half years old this year, moving into our 17th year. Um, we began, a lot of us that started the company, we all worked together in another firm here in the Knoxville community, and we just got together and decided that we would try to start something new and different and build a culture-based firm, uh, first of all. Um, so we took a leap of faith, uh, started out with no clients, no, no idea what to do, started in the basement of my home. Um, did that for about four months until the wife said it's time to go <laughs> and then found a permanent space and, and moved into that. And so the, the rest has been, has been history. We've, um, we've had a great time doing what we're doing. Now, tell me about this thing about culture. What did you guys envision? What did you mean? What was it that you weren't seeing at the firm you were at? Kind of walk me through that so I can understand. You know, at the time, I'm not even sure we even knew what culture really, really meant. Uh, we just knew that in the place that we were, which was a fairly large firm, and it was a great firm, don't, don't get me wrong. There were just some things about um, the turnover that was taking place in the company, uh, the leadership, the lack of transparency in certain areas. And as I sort of grew up in, in the organization and, and became um, project manager and associate with that organization, just beginning to see some things that just didn't settle with me, and not that they were necessarily wrong, but things that just didn't feel right to, to me. And so when we started our company, we wanted, we knew we wanted it to feel different. We knew we wanted it to be more transparent. Uh, we knew we wanted it to be more uh, horizontal or yeah, more horizontal as opposed to vertical in our organization. So just some things like that. And it wasn't until about, I don't know, six, eight years ago that I really started to do some reading about business and, and found out about this thing called culture and what it meant and, and came to find out that we actually had a pretty darn good one. Um, and it was quite by, I want to say it was by accident, but I do think there was a little bit of intentionality when we started the company about wanting it to feel different. 
Awesome. Can you tell me when you're working at that other firm? And obviously you said that that was a great firm and we understand that not every firm's a fit for everyone, but what were some of the things specifically that you're looking at that maybe rubbed you the wrong way or thought, you know, I'd like to do this a different way. Uh, some of it was just how um, employees were treated. Um, and I don't, again, I don't want to say that they were mistreated in any way, but just there was a clear definition between us and them, those that were in senior leadership versus those that were employees. And, and there were clearly things that, that were your job and that were not, you know, getting outside of the things that were your job or trying to, trying to take on some additional responsibilities and grow in some other areas wasn't necessarily encouraged. Um, there wasn't... Um, there just wasn't a lot of what I felt was good team building practices. Of course, we worked in teams. Um, it was a little bit siloed in some respects. Um, we had some different departments in that organization, and it really never felt like there was some strong connections between the different design groups in the office. Uh, and then, of course, you never really knew where the firm sort of stood you know, financially and, and what was going on from the marketing aspect. So there were lots of things you just kind of showed up and did your job and wondered how things worked, but didn't really get a chance to be plugged into how things worked. And, and take that a little bit further. Awesome. Now, when along the line of starting the new firm, did it sort of click with the culture thing that, hey, what we're looking for is culture. You talked about some doing some business readings. Take me through that process. Yeah. I mean, again, when we started the company, as I said, you know, when you, when you start a new business, it's all about, you know, how are we going to make payroll, keep the, the, the lights on and everything else. And so we started this thing and, and got up and running and we were blessed to, to get some work pretty, pretty quickly. And, you know, it, before long, we were busy being busy. And after a while, we sort of um, took a step back. And this was right, right before, um, I, well, I guess it was actually right after the recession. And we went through um, an instance where one of our partners in the company, an older gentleman that started the business with us, uh, had to retire early due to some health issues. And so at that point in time, I became the president of Studio 4 Design. And we really just began to look at how things were going in the office. We knew that we had uh, some good work, but we just kind of felt like something was missing. And, and we started asking ourselves the question of why are we doing what we're doing and, and really began to take a look back at why we started the company. And, and a lot of that just sort of circled back around to the culture and to the, you know, to the things that were going on. And we realized again, that we had um, good engagement with our employees. We had really good, um, uh, really good camaraderie amongst our staff and began to find some commonalities in what was working there. And as I began to read some things like Jim Collins, good to great and some other uh, business resources that were out there, read some things by just John Maxwell and leadership uh, Andy Stanley um, and a few other authors, just understanding about, you know, the company culture um, and how important that is and come to realize that that was really one of the things that we had built a good foundation on. Like I said, not really knowing what we were doing at the time, but just putting some things into practice about just on, in our Monday morning staff meetings, going through all of the expenses and things that the company has, you know, without disclosing personal information, but making sure that people understand what it takes to make the business work. And they know that we have to pay insurance and rent and, and, and consultants and other things along the way. So we, we you know, it, we almost, to, maybe it was too much information at times, but I think we did a great job kind of just establishing that tra transparency in the organization um, and learning really what culture meant and, and, and then really learning that we had done some things right and beginning to celebrate people for what they do and how they represent our core values in the organization. We kind of re redefined those and made that a big deal in our company. And so we, we uh, in fact, we just had our Christmas party uh, just this last week and we give core value awards every year to the employees that, that best display our core values. And, um, you know, so it's just been something we begin to celebrate and making it part of the cold cultural experience at Studio 4 Design. And looking back, in the last 16 and a half years of our company, we've never lost an employee in our organization to another firm in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Nobody's gone across the street where the grass is growing. We've had people leave. Um, spouses have moved into other markets and they've had, they've had to leave or they've you move closer to home or things like that. But we've been able to retain uh, most of the talent that we've had um, and not lose them to the competition locally. So tell me, you said you had this realization as you're going through this process of, of reading and learning and absorbing all this great information that's out there. What was it specifically that tuned you into culture and said, you know what, I, I can see culture is important here. We're not only going to talk about it, we're actually going to implement some things. Why do you feel that culture is so important? If you don't have people that are engaged in your mission and your vision, um, then what they're going to do is just uh, come to work looking to cash a paycheck or collect a paycheck. I think if people become passionate about uh, your vision, the type of work that you're doing and, and buy into your system um, and that are, that are really committed to the work and the, and the cause that you're doing, they sort of set the culture for you because they come in and bring an attitude and an ethic every day that 
you know, isn't, isn't satisfied with status quo. And it also begins to kind of weed that out in, in, in the office. If you've got people that aren't quite on board with that. And we've kind of seen that happen with some folks that we've had to dismiss through cultural reasons. And you find out real quickly, you know, the, the rest of the staff kind of lets you know how that's going and you can kind of see if they're not working out. And so it even changed our hiring practices, you know, quite a, quite a degree to start looking for people that again, had the characteristics that we felt like would fit good within our culture, even if their resume wasn't necessarily exactly what we were looking for. We found it's a lot easier to teach people how to do what we do. But you can't teach them how to act the way we want them to act. You said that there were some people who, as this started to get implemented, they just they just weren't a fit. Um, what were some of the warning signs or some of the indicators that allowed you to see that? What does that look like in an organization? Stacy, I think when you see people that aren't willing to become accountable to their own actions, um, that's a that's a key indicator that that kind of don't want to have um, a sense of personal accountability. Um, that's a strong indicator. People that sort of disconnect and don't want to engage in the dialogue and feel the freedom to disagree with the president in a staff meeting or to express a different idea. When you see people kind of that are withdrawn and not and not necessarily that you have to have an office full of extroverts, but to have people that are really even, even those, the ones that we have that are most introverted, when you're talking about something that they're passionate about, they engage in the conversation. And so we look for people that aren't afraid to express opinions and ideas and try new things and, and suggest things. And so, it, it, again, it's, it's an accountability measure for us as the leadership to allow them to take some risk the same way we took the same risk in starting the company, um, you know, 16 years ago. Awesome. How, how, did you, how has your uh, hiring practices uh, evolved over time in, in terms of this culture? Oh, fairly greatly. Um, in fact, it's almost an exhaustive process that we go through now. Um, and a lot of it, again, is we're, we're constantly interviewing. That's one thing that we started to do differently is always start looking at people. And, and even when we would get a resume from somebody, even if we're not hiring, you know, just for us to not only for us to practice interviewing, but for them to practice interviewing as well, um, we began just to talk to more people and always keep our eyes and ears open. So that was kind of step number one, as opposed to, oh, my goodness, we've got a manpower need next month. Let's go see if we can hire some production help and then have to hire someone as a, as a you know, trigger decision and not, and not get a good cultural fit. So we began to look at that. We also began to look at, you know, what are the kinds of questions we can ask that will reveal um, any sort of bent toward our core values? You know, work ethic types of questions and, and passion types of questions and, you know, what kinds of things are they involved with beyond um, – their professional career, what kind of things to get their, you know, what kind of things break their heart in our world, in our, in our community. We're very much to try to be a give back organization and, and understand that what we do as architects also has an impact on lives of people, whether it's in, in a, in a, in a for-profit situation or a non-for-profit situation. So just trying to find out what makes people tick and what's on the inside gives us a sense of what their core values are. And you can't just do that in one interview. So the first thing we did was we just started a, a simple drive by where we would just meet out of the office for a cup of coffee or a, or a drink in the afternoon just to kind of get to know the person. And, and, and it's also a little bit less threatening for them to have to come and sit in the conference room of an architect's office and, and, and wear the suit and bring the briefcase and the, and the portfolio. So we make that a very, just a very 30,000 foot, let's get to know one another, tell me where you're from, what you're about. And then from that, if we feel like it's worth a next step, then we get the next level of people involved. And we also, from that point, it becomes, okay, we'll bring a project manager perhaps in or, or, a, or somebody that's going to be at their peer level to actually interview them. And so we go through several sort of discussions. And, it, and then at the, one of the final things that we do is we let them go to lunch with one or two just of the, of the folks that they're going to be working with to see if, you know, all, this, all these great things we're telling them about working at Studio 4 Designer for real. Are, are we who we say we are? And we also hope that through that lunch and through that sort of one-on-one -on -one dialogue with some of our staff folks, we get kind of a good sense of, are they say, are they who they say, are they, are they not just interviewing well, but are they really who they, who they say they are? And it's worked out really well uh, since we changed that practice and we actually take the time to follow all of our steps and don't skip steps along the way. We've been able to hire some, some really nice, uh, nice folks and that complement us really well. So in including that initial interview, that's the coffee kind of sit down meeting. And then the, we have the, uh, the, the last interview that you told me about, which is the peer based interview. How many interviews are part of this process, Stacy? Um, it's usually about four, sometimes a little bit more depending on, um, sometimes where people are coming from and what they're doing, but usually it's about a minimum of four different conversations before we actually get to the point of talking about an offer. Gotcha. And can give me some examples of some of these questions you said where you're asking about things that, you, that go along with your core values, like the work ethic, like being able to express themselves. What are some of the questions that you would ask specifically to get that information out of them? 
Yeah, I mean, we, we sometimes pose some um, some role play type scenarios. If you were in this situation, what would you do? Or, and, and some questions that really don't have a, a perfectly correct answer, such as what's more important to you, finishing something on time or finishing something accurately? That's a good, a good opportunity to find out where someone's coming from when they approach a situation, because there really isn't a, a perfect answer to that. If you had to choose one, what's more important to you? Um, we ask questions about the types of things that they see in their community that they think need, need to be changed. And then we ask, well, how do you think your role as an architect or an interior designer can have an impact on that? Um, and find out some of the things that they're involved in outside of the office. And um, we ask them what their hobbies are. We ask them, um, you know, we ask them uh, the types of things they like to do for fun on the weekends, just to kind of get a sense of, of their spirit of adventure or their spirit of taking risk. If they're mountain climbers, you know, you can kind of think that that may, that may translate into a, a spirit of risk in, in uh, what they're going to do professionally. Um, you know, we asked them, of course, the, the things about the, the, what they love about the profession, why they wanted to be an architect in the first place, you know, what prompted them to go to design school to enter this profession. So we, we drilled down on that. And then of course, when they, when they answer those questions, we, we sort of follow that up with another question. Well, tell me a little bit more about that to kind of get, peel back the layers of the onions, so to speak. And it doesn't take long to kind of find out, uh, you know, where, people sort of fit in, you know, we kind of make little notes about, you know, Hey, this is core value. Number one, really, really strong sense that they, you know, that they're a, that they're a, a go beyond core value. Number one for us is go beyond. They're willing to go the extra mile and do what they need to do to get the job done. Um, you know, do they value others? That's one of our core values. That's, um, you know, do they have a sense? Do they, do they care about their community? Do they care about people. Um, so yeah, just some things like that that just lead into an understanding of their DNA. Awesome. So you gave us two of your core values. What are the other core values at the firm, Stacey? We have so far, we have uh, go beyond and value mm -hmm. others. So uh, we have uh, go beyond. We have invest yourself. That's our second core value. The third core value is value others. And our fourth core value is empower and collaborate. Um, and again, we uh, back in 2012, you know, so I guess let me preface that by saying when we started our company and wrote our first business plan, we had this very exhaustively long mission statement and all of these things that, that nobody could ever remember. So that's sort of the, the typical mistake you make when you write your first business plan. You come up with these great ideas, but they're always too wordy and nobody can think of it. So we really tried to drill those things down into those essence points. And all those four core values that I talked about were essence points out of these paragraphs that we wrote um, back in 2002. And they all kind of reflect back to what we boil down the essence of our mission is. And it's on our website and other, other literature that we produce. And it's the, the design matters um, sort of idea that what we do matters. Um, it matters because people matter. And that's kind of the whole, the whole focus of where those core values sort of draw out of. Awesome. So we have your, your mission is design matters and mm -hmm. that ties into people matters. Uh, what is the vision or have you already told me that I just missed it? Well, the vision of our organization as it has been since, since day one is we want to be sort of known as the preeminent, uh, design firm in our, in our, in our region. Uh, not just for the work that we do, but as, as a place to work and for designers to grow and and to and to um, be the best professionals that they that they can be. And so we were really really proud this past year to actually be recognized by the um, the Tennessee AIA as a uh, as a leader, sort of in the emerging professional um, the things that we do for emerging professionals in our design community. So they actually this was the first no second year they had a an award that they gave for that. And one of our emerging professionals actually came to me and said, you know what, we think you, we would qualify for this, for the things that we do here. And I said, that's fantastic. Run with that and let's see what happens. And sure enough, we actually were able to win an award in that category. So we're taking steps in that direction. I, I tell our people all the time, we're, we, if we ever think we've arrived at either one of these, these points, we, we probably are fooling ourselves. So it's, it's the goal every day to press on to continue to show excellence in design and excellence in the way that we uh, organize our business and manage our business and how we treat our people and, and what we do. But that's, that's sort of where our, our vision is now. And as we transition into new leadership um, over the next few years, we hope that they will embrace that, continue to embrace that vision and take that even possibly to the, you know, beyond that and beyond. Awesome. So as I was looking at your website in preparation for the interview, Stacy, uh, I noticed and I see this on some firm's websites that when I go to the staff page, which is where I'll often go to find out who works there and a little bit about your bio, that it's very non-hierarchical, right? Yes. And I think that's intentional that I, I couldn't tell immediately who the leaders in the firm were. I had to actually look 
And then when I also look at the pictures of you guys as a group, it's the same thing. It's not like you guys are in the middle or standing out at the front. I actually see you here and you're on the very right side. In another picture, your face is obscured by someone's hand. So mm -hmm. I, I get the feeling that you've developed a culture of leadership where it's not all about Stacy and the other partners. And I'd like to ask you, um, where does that come from? How are you able to do that? Yeah, I'll tie that to our uh, our last core value and empower and collaborate. I mean, we feel very strongly that, um, especially as leaders, that our job is to is to replicate ourselves uh, in the organization. So to do that, you have to empower others um, and you have to give them the authority to make decisions. You have to give put them in positions where they feel like they're leading in their um, sphere of influence. And so if we continue to put ourselves in the center of the photographs and at the top of the list and everything else, it just doesn't reinforce that spirit of here. We're empowering you to be part of this organization just as much as I am. I have my role. My role is to do interviews like this on architectural podcasts and do other things in front of the company as the president. But your role is to be the best designer you can be. Those two roles are totally different and they have, they have uh, different levels of importance, but in the organization, but they're equally important to, to who we are and what we do. I mean, everyone in the picture is smiling, so apparently they like working there. And you said you haven't lose, lost anyone through turnover. What have you found really motivates staff in, in terms of making them feel like excited to be there? Yeah, that's a question that, that it's at the end of every time we do sort of our annual, and we don't call them performance reviews, they're sort of annual checkups and goal setting for the previous year. But it's it's how do you like to be rewarded and what can I do a better job? What can we do better? What can I do better personally as, as, as the you know, as your boss, as your leader to let you know that you're doing a great job. And so um, people have different love languages. I don't know if you're familiar with, with that terminology, but people are receive um, uh, praise and admiration in different ways. Some of it's just being told that they do a good job. Others it's, it's, it's a financial reward. Others it's, you know, you do something for them, you give them an extra day off. I mean, I think I'm always looking for the nugget that actually speaks to one person individual. We just don't have a a set, this is what you do, you know, kind of thing. And I always ask people from time to time, um, like to take them out just to have coffee. Hey, you know, am I, am I telling you enough that you're doing a good job or am I showing you that we appreciate you well enough? And, and that's, I think they appreciate the fact that, you know, if you haven't done that in a while, um, you know, it's just a good tech for me because again, that's a very, very intentional thing. It's not in my, my nature to go to do that just without having to be intentional about it and make notes or even set reminders of my calendar. Hey, you need to go downstairs today and talk to one or two people, you know, today and, and let them know that they're, they're doing a great job and that you appreciate what they're, what they're doing. Handwritten notes for some, you know, I've had, I've had some employees that will show me a stack of notes that, that I've written them over the years and that they've kept. And in fact, that's, that's what speaks to me. I've had, um, you know, when I get handwritten notes back from employees who've, who've appreciated something that we've done for them, I've got a drawer full of, you know, cards and notes that, that folks have written me that, you know, it just, it just speaks to me. And I like to go back and, and reflect on that. And it, again, it just reinforces that that's what it's all about is, 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 um, making sure that people know that they're appreciated and what they're doing for you. Hey, Architect Nation, real fast, I want to draw your attention to May 1st through the 3rd, 2019. I'm hosting the Architect Business Summit in Chicago, Illinois, and I would love to meet you there in person. During these three days, some of the most successful architects I've had the pleasure of working with will pull back the curtain to reveal what they're doing to grow their income, freedom, and impact as firm owners. This will be the must attend event for architecture firm owners in 2019. You won't want to miss this. Go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash live to get information on who will be speaking and find out how to grab your ticket. If you had to summarize this idea of leadership, of culture, of empowering others in your staff, you, you mentioned this thing, which is very captivating of replicating yourselves, right? What would you say would be the top key points to be able to make that happen in a firm? Well, you've got to be willing to, um, you know, again, in, a, in an architectural firm, there's so many different tasks and, and roles and, and not everybody's going to be great at, at, at certain parts of that, but you've got to give people the freedom to try it out because again, when it goes back to our hiring process, we're not hiring, we're, we're not hiring somebody just to be a production person or just to be an architectural designer and, and, and tell them that's the box that you're going to live in when you come here. So we're looking for people that want to be versatile to start with and people that want to have the full gamut of experience um, that this profession has to offer, even, even to the sales and marketing aspect and the running the business aspects and all of those pieces and parts of it. So the more that we can expose them to that, at different points along their career, the, the more we can sort of figure out what their strengths are and, and the areas that they're going to be able to help us most. And so I think we try to reinforce that and get people engaged at different levels 
um, as quickly as we can. And we often find that they're continually, you know, asking for more. It's, you know, they want to drink from the fire hose. You know, they, they want to, uh, they want to take on more and more responsibility and, 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 it, and we want to give more and more responsibility too. And sometimes you have to be careful because we've got a lot of really great young people that are, in fact, right out of school that just are taking on things that I wouldn't have even thought to have done, you know, for the first two or three years I was in the business, I was just happy clicking a mouse and drawing, you know, on a drafting board. Um, but the, uh, I think some of it just is in some of the, the kids and the folks that we're seeing coming out of the profession today and, and the, the quality of the talent that's out there and what they really want as well. But I think, you know, even I think the firms that are missing out a huge opportunity, if they're not exposed, their staff at all levels to all sorts of different things. Um, it's just going to make them better professionals. They're going to add more value to the organization that they're in. Um, and it's, it's been so far a good thing for us to, to engage with people that way. What's your process, Stacey, for delegating, for getting things off your plate so you and the other firm leaders aren't the ones who are doing everything and just running around with your, your shirts or your hair on fire? <laughs> well, if I had to say there's one thing we probably don't have a really good defined process in, yeah, that would be it. Uh, uh, um, I think a lot of the, that we kind of leave up now sort of to the individual style of the leader um, and where they're at. We talk about it often in our in our leadership meetings about what are you doing today or what are you doing this week that you could you could push down to somebody else. In fact, as we have challenged our our senior staff, our project managers, um, as we go into 2019, for them to be able to step up and and take on another level in the in the marketing and business development responsibilities. How do we teach and train our our newly licensed architects and our job captains to take on more of the project management responsibilities. How do we teach and train them? So we're always kind of talking about that. And, and again, I'm not sure we have a great process there yet. That may be something we've got to, to drill down into uh, as well. So we do have a little bit more consistency in how we do that. But some of it is too, just, you know, the feel for, Hey, this person is doing a great job in this area. So therefore I'm now giving her some responsibility in this area and here's how she's doing for us. And so um, that's kind of how it's working. It's a little bit more organic, I guess, if that's organic is a great word for, we don't have a process. Um, but that's kind of how it's working in our, in our office right now. And, it, and so far, you know, the size of our firm, it's 16, 17 people. Um, I'm not sure that we are desperate in need of a process, but as we grow and scale at some point in time, that's going to be critical to how we, to how we scale. Awesome. And do you have plans to grow and scale? Um, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, and, and that's been sort of the uh, thing that's been on my mind over the past couple of years. I, I recently went through um, a, a program called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses. Uh, I actually graduated from that uh, about this time last year. And part of what they challenge business owners to do is look at growth and scalability in the organization. And so that's one thing that we've, we've thought a lot about. And I have seen examples of other firms who have, um, you know, either taken on uh, lots of new market sectors and things like that to grow. They, they've added some verticals that they weren't doing before to kind of grow into. They've acquired some other businesses and I've, I've seen those things not go so well. Um, I've seen mergers that have ended in, in ugly splits uh, in our profession. And I think a lot of the reason that happens is there's not a, an analysis of what's going to happen when those two cultures come together. So part of me trying to figure out how studio four design will grow and scale over the next five, 10, 15 years is how does that have an impact on culture? Can we be the same at 40 people as we are at, at you know, 15 to 20 people? Uh, could we be the same if we opened up a satellite office um, in another market a hundred miles from here that we can be here? Um, so that scalability and that transference of culture from one market to the next it is really good. And so I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer for how we do that. It's, do that yet. Now we can look at growth and revenue and, and all that. And, and that's, that's one way to grow and we can grow to, you know, 20, 30, whatever, but, but how do, how do we, how do we protect the culture in, in the growth? Um, that's, that's probably the thing that we would be wrestling with the most as we sort of look at our, our growth and projection plan over the next five to 10 years. And knowing what you know now, as you look at this roadmap of scaling, what does that look like to you? What are the key things that you feel need to fall into place to be able to make that happen? You know, quite honestly, I believe um, I need to be able to get uh, my next level of leadership beyond our, our, our senior leadership, that next level of leadership to grow to a point where they can take on that next level of authority in the organization so that I could then be able to take one of them and move them somewhere else if necessary and say, I know that if I take this person out of Knoxville and put them in, let's say, in the Tri-Cities, which is 100 miles northeast of here, and we were to do something there or, or Chattanooga or Nashville, how could, could they go there and could they could they be the seed that's planted to do that? And do they have the, the trust and the capacity 
um, to, to be able to do that. Or if we, um, if we grow to the next level where we have, uh, you know, say we double in size over the next uh, 10 years, how do we, you know, transfer that into an organization where I'm not going to be as, as, as accessible to the people in the, at the, at the entry level of the organization. Maybe I'm, I've got to be, I'm not in the office as much anymore, maybe when that happens, or how can I still be that, that, uh, that principal or that president of the company that can still engage and, and, and really dig into people's lives, the more people that we have. And so I think that's going to be a, a part of it. Has, has how, are there other people in the organization that can invest in people in the same way that they still feel like they're getting the same value out of the top of the organization? Does that make, does that make sense? I'm not sure if that translated the way I wanted it to, but that's kind of the gist of it. <clears throat> Stacy, when, when you look at mentoring people and this idea of leadership, uh, what is your process? You did mention performance reviews. What's your process for performance reviews? How do you guys handle that? Um, from a performance standpoint, um, if there is any issue with performance uh, or lack of performance, we kind of address those things at the time it happens. That's not wait. We, we don't wait till the end of the year to kind of say, hey, back in March, you did this. And, you know, we, we kind of take care of performance issues when they when they happen or try to figure out what's going on. Is there is there, you know, hey, is there something happening outside of the office that's causing the problem? What can we how can I help? How can I help fix it? First of all, that's sort of the attitude. And then here's what we need to do to kind of correct things and move them on. And so we sort of let these annual things be sort of goal setting um, uh opportunities for the employees to sit down and, and reflect back on we ask questions like what was what was a big win for you this past year and let them talk what a key win for them was and then we said well what was a what would you consider as a loss or something that didn't go quite so well and what did you learn from that so we talk about those kinds of things we challenge them to have at least four up, up to four goals no more than that because I think any more than that's too hard to handle and then we we kind of review those goals with them and then we make sure that those goals are measurable and actionable and that they have somebody in the office that's going to hold them accountable to the goal. It's not going to be me. You know, I can't, I can't do that for everybody. So we, t we then encourage them to, to team up with somebody to, to be accountable to the goal process. And then we kind of ask the, the loaded question at the end, what do you want your position to be here in five years from today? And for the new people, it's kind of like, I just want to continue to have a, have a place to work and grow as a, you know, A, B or C position. And then, then you have others that start to realize, Hey, I feel like I'm, I'm moving towards project management or I'm really moving towards design or I'm moving more towards this area of, of the business. And so then we challenge them, how can we help you to get there? And so it's really kind of an introspective kind of thing where they can kind of look at what they've done. They can, they can um, talk about their successes and failures over the year and what their lessons learned were and then what they're going to try to do in the coming year to help not only grow themselves personally, but the organization. And that's kind of all ties back to our invest yourself uh, core value. Speaking of investing yourself, well, let, let's go here first. When you look at uh, when you look at people in the organization, and as you're looking to scale, and you're looking for the right people that'll be able to move up in leadership, what are the skills and qualities that you feel are important that those people need to have? Uh, by far, the number one skill they need to have is be able to be be able to build relationships. Uh, I think everything that we do in this business, whether it's um, working collaboratively with your uh, with your peer next door to solve a design problem uh, in the office or whether you're working with a client or a consultant or anything else, you have to have the ability to um, to form relationships and to understand where the other person that you're working with is coming from and, and, and have that kind of connection. So I think that's, that's a, that's a strong uh, thing that we believe in is and teaching people again, uh, a lot of folks that I guess if you've been just depending on the, the, the other cultures and other things that some people might've been exposed to where they worked before, those, those relationships can become adversarial, whether it's an architect contractor, you know, you hear horror stories of, uh, of those kinds of things. And so we, we, we have such fantastic relationships with contractors and um, it all goes back to, you know, how I was taught uh, you know, into the best person to get to know in, uh, in the architecture world is a superintendent on a job site, form a relationship with that guy and you'll have fewer change orders on yeah. projects. So again, I think relationships are the key to that. Awesome. Tell me about your second core value, invest yourself. What does that mean? So invest yourself means, am I investing in the mission, vision, and goals of the company? And I'm also, am I also investing personally to my own professional growth, um, whatever it might be. So we challenge people not only to get plugged into what we're doing at Studio 4 Design, get involved in, in some of the in-house committees that we have to make things kind of happen, but what are you doing to grow professionally? You know, we have folks that are on the path of licensure. What, do you, what steps are you taking to actually get licensed and move into that next step? And then now that you're licensed, what, what are you doing to continue your education besides 
attend a lunch at an AIA meeting. Those are the easy things to do. But so we, we challenge people to invest themselves in, in training and to bring things in to teach other people in the office. So it's kind of a two-way street. What are we investing in uh, personally, but also what are you investing in as far as our mission and vision and getting behind what we're doing and being all in with our company? Awesome. And you know, when you talk about this idea of you're, you're investing in, um, you're, you're asking them to invest in the company, the mission, the vision, and the values. You're looking for people who are willing to invest in their own personal progress and development. What does the company do, do or do you do anything in terms of training them, a- exposing them to some of these qualities and skills that you feel will bump them up to the next level? Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're always looking for ways to, um, to educate and and add value to our employees, whether it's um, attending one of your webinars, you know, for example, or, or anything else in the, in the industry that adds value to them. There are lots of things that, you know, I would say in a lot of other places, those are things that typically your project managers or maybe your senior leadership participate in, in professional insurance seminars, for example. We believe it's important for everybody to sit in one of those to understand what are the kind of things that we're exposed to in our profession is risk issues. And so it won't be out of the question for us to have even our production people sitting in on a professional liability insurance seminar to understand uh, how important risk mitigation is in our industry, just so they can get exposed to that. So, and that's another thing that we challenge them. We want you guys to go out and look for these opportunities. Where can, what things can you find? Could we send you to, um, you know, to a training session? Could you, could you bring something into us that we could use as a training session? So we're always looking for that. And we're also giving it back to them because again, that's a way for them to invest themselves in the company to help bring those things to the table so we can all learn and grow from them. Awesome. When, when you look at, uh, once again, this, this idea of leadership and growing people up in the company, being able to help them take up that next level of responsibility. You know, I was looking on your website. It's fantastic when we see the different awards that you have, right? You have different awards right. for people who exemplify one of your core values. And they're, they're cool little trophies. Obviously, they're not super expensive to produce. But we realize that the the satisfaction people get is recognition and being recognized for that. So that's kind of cool. Talk a little bit about that. But then also, I'd like to know how your bonus compensation structure works. How does the money side come into it? How do you guys incentivize your employees? Tell me about that. Sure. Okay. First on the core value thing, that's a... That's actually something that we do on an annual basis. We just we just did it at our Christmas party um, uh, last weekend, and so we not we have people nominate folks in the office for the various core values, and also describe why they're nominating them, and then we take all those and of course you know look look and see where the votes come out and kind of distribute the awards sort of that way. And then my partners and I kind of look at all of those together to determine who sort of is the employee of the year, the blue vase winner that we call it. And to do that. And so we make a really big deal about it at the Christmas party. And we read the comments that people say about the people and kind of hold them in suspense. And then they get to come up, get the award. We take the pictures, we hand out a you know a little cash prize with that and so forth. And so, yeah, it is a big deal. They're all sitting on their desk right now. If you walk through the office, you'll see the little trophies that are meaningless, but um, they have still have a lot of intrinsic value um, sitting on their desk and everything. So that's, that's a big deal. And it's special. As far as the bonus plan goes, we have a, we do have a system of of rewards uh, that are performance-based awards. So um, that's again evaluated by looking at some certain measurable things as far as project goals. So like for example, our project managers get bonus compensation based on financial metrics and things that they accomplish and marketing things that they achieve and some things like, things like that. Our production people get, get bonus based on the types of efficiency they're doing on projects and keeping projects, helping keep projects under budget. So we do have some, some metrics that we look at and then it's basically just what, what's the pot of money look like. And we divide that up, you know, kind of proportionally to be able to distribute to folks. Um, and we try to do that more than once a year. Uh, again, that just is all a function of cash flow and, and what we have at the time and, you know, other variables in place like that. Okay. Awesome. And do, do you have any stock ownership, uh, kind of distribution employee stock ownership plan, or is it basically just bonuses at this time? That's a fantastic question. In fact, that's something that we are just now having conversations with people about, about uh, ownership in the company and what that looks like and going through the process of um, doing evaluation of the company and setting a value of the stock. Because we do have some folks that um, kind of have gotten to that level of leadership that, they, that we want them to be invested in, not only f- you know, personally and everything else, but also financially so that they can uh, start the ownership track. And so that's actually something that in the last three months, we just started having some serious conversations about. So we're kind of in the formative stages of going through all that as we speak. Awesome. 
Now, of course, growing any firm and even continuing to sustain a firm, a lot of that is business development. I always don't yes. like to let my guests leave without asking them what they find to be effective for bringing in new work, Stacy. Well, again, that's that's touched on it earlier about relationships. I mean, if, if folks have the ability to connect and communicate, um, that's the most effective business development tool there is out there. That's all part of the game and be able to ask good questions. Um, I've got a great project manager right now that, uh, you know, when she started with us, she was an unlicensed, you know, basically job captain type position, but she had that uh, inherent sort of uh, it, you know, you notice when somebody has it. And so just the ability to, I knew right away that she was going to be a potential rainmaker for us one day and began to put her in position to be with me when I'm out um, doing uh, business development activities and communicating with clients and building that relationship. And so she's just had a, a phenomenal amount of success um, in growing into that role. And so it's now time for her. I'm, I'm starting to watch her start to, to pass that down to a few others in the office that are kind of in the same area. So it's really encouraging to see that take place. But we have committed this year to making sure that we have everyone on our team from top to bottom engaged in business development at some level in the organization more than we've ever had before. Because it's been very easy to kind of let you know, us up here market, let these down here produce. But I think we, in order for us to really take it to the next level, we need everybody to be engaged in it at some level. And, and, and to the understanding that, that everybody's going to have a different degree and skill set with that, just like we all have different degrees and skill set at designing buildings or spec writing or producing documents. Some people are going to be better than others, but we need everybody engaged at it at some level in the organization. Awesome. So, you know, I, 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 invited you on the podcast because I was reached out to by someone who works with you, works for a PR firm, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for those who are listening, architects, uh, it's very interesting, I find, how some architects, uh, a very few minority invest in things like PR, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't realize that some of the interviews I do here on Business of Architecture is because someone actively solicits to be on the show. And then, of course, I do my due diligence and I find, do I really want to have this person on? Are they going to be <laughs> able to deliver the value? And then that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm all game for it. Uh, so just to let our audience know, hey, look, this is something that successful firms out there are doing. I want to kind of sure. peel back the curtain on that. And then I want to ask you, in terms of things you're spending money on to market, like PR and maybe some of the activities you're doing, what are you finding to be the most successful things or the things that you believe in the most that you want to keep investing in? Tell me about that. Well, by far and hands down, I think we, we get more um, business development traffic driven to us through the website than anything else. And I, I don't think that's that's going to change anytime soon. Social media also has, has had some impact on that. Um, and again, taking our website to the next level, making our website more interactive and, and being able to drive more business and capture more leads. That's obviously something that, that we're interested in doing kind of to move that needle to the next or move that to the next step as far as that goes. But, um, you know, again, we, we, we find there's very little value in, in advertising and, and magazines and things like that, unless I'm getting advertised in, you know, a, a church facility. We do a lot of church work. And so when I get the chance to write an article and be featured in a, in a church facility magazine, I tend to get, I tend to get some response from that. Positioning ourselves as experts in the industry, uh, really is the best thing, best advertising you can do. And a lot of that's very inexpensive to do. And that's, you know, one of the things we challenged our, our, PR firm to do is not just write press releases when we need to do press releases or find opportunities like this for me to participate in, but also look for things that we can do to contribute and show professional expertise. And I think that uh, that helps really kind of set us aside and set us apart in, in the industry. And, and and really anybody in the office you know, can participate in things like that. That's awesome. Uh, Stacy. how are you personally growing right now? Are there any books that you're sort of diving into right now to, to, to sharpen your saw? Oh man, uh, you know I've actually the last few months I have just taken some time to sit back and read some fun stuff. <laughs> I read, I try to read, um, I try to read some. I just finished a great book on the life of Neil Armstrong, which I think is a fascinating read about a, about a man who was very dri very driven in what he did and and how he took his passions and put himself in the position to be our you know the first man on the moon. Um, but I also try to read. I'm I'm a, I'm a Christian and I also try to read something that's going to sort of grow me spiritually. Um, on a regular basis. So I just picked up a new book by Francis Chan that I'm going to start reading here pretty soon. And also I'm a business junkie. I mean, I read things from Dave Ramsey to Andy Stanley and Michael Hyatt and, um, you know, Seth Godin and, and things like that. Any, any of those, if, if somebody hasn't um, and is interested in at least getting a foundation started on something, I'd highly recommend they pick up, um, you know, Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey's. I think it's a fantastic book, but if they want something a little bit more industry specific, uh, Arthur Gensler's book, I think is fantastic. Um, you know, he just really paints a really clear, easy picture of, of how uh, Gensler became Gensler and, and just how to 
um, you know, some just little anecdotal things. I don't know if you've, if you've read that either. It's a fantastic read. I would recommend that to, to anybody in our profession to pick that one up and give it a shot. And I hope Arthur will give me some royalty credit if he, if he hears this. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I actually have an interview I did with Art Gensler and uh, have read the book. It's really great. Uh, speaking of Dave Ramsey, for those that aren't watching the video, Stacy kind of has the Dave Ramsey look going on. So just imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had uh, I had dinner last night with a um, with a, uh, a friend of mine. We go back a long way. We used to work together, and he's now a principal in a large firm uh, in Dallas, Texas. And um, you know, he was telling me just about Gensler that they're asking who. I said, "Who are you? Who's who's kicking your butt out there right now?" And of course. He's just talked about how Gensler's kind of owned the office, the office world and how they're really, really good at, at, at office and trying to reinvent what the office is and everything. And that just kind of reinforced to me about be good at what you're good at, know what you know, and be the best you can be at what your, you know, what your skill sets are and become that expert that people, when they see your name and see that associated with it, they say, hey, that's the right choice. It doesn't matter if I've got 10 other people to choose from. This, this, these are the guys that are you know, leading in that industry. And that's kind of where we've challenged ourselves to be. That's awesome. And that is a great place to end the interview today. Before I do that, however, Stacey, I'd like to ask you, is there any question that you feel that I should have asked that I didn't? Oh, wow. Um, no, I think you, I think, uh, this was a great, great discussion. I think, um, you know, I'm trying to think of anything specific. I think I probably said a lot about culture, a lot about, I, I guess, um, uh, no, I think you, I think you did great. Okay, well, we nailed it. Thank you, Stacy. Stacy Cox is uh, the president of Studio Four Design, based out in Knoxville, Tennessee. So, thanks for joining us today, Stacy. Yep, I uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank you. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.